Good afternoon and welcome to um, a, a, the first lecture, I think, by uh, Head of Department during the Alumni Weekend. Um, it's called the 2020 Vision because my term of office is from 1st September of this year till the end of August 2019. It's a five-year sentence um, <laughs> with no remission for good behaviour. And so I will be taking the department to just before the year 2020. So hence the title for... Um, the, uh, my lecture. So, welcome, and it's very nice to see the lecture room filled uh, almost to capacity. I know it will be later on this afternoon for the Jenkins lecture. For those of you who don't know me, just a little bit uh, of background. Um, one of the reasons for doing the lecture and emailing all alumni is actually I am an alumnus myself. I, I believe I'm the second head of department in our um, 116 year history, if I've got the numbers right, so 106 year history uh, to, to be an alumnus of the department. Professor David Clark before me, uh, who most of you will remember, was head of department and he'd been an undergraduate here. I was an undergraduate here uh, at Keeble in the late 70s. I was offered a DPhil by the department when I finished, but wasn't sure I wanted to do academic research. I went off to a company called Raycool Electronics. During the time that I was there, this pan out Raycall Vodafone. Um, the person who took over from me became the CTO of Raycall Vodafone and retired as a very rich billionaire about 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I don't regret that career choice at all uh, because I came back uh, in 1981 to do a DPhil in medical electronics, again here in Oxford, but not in engineering science, actually in one of the clinical departments. I then was still trying to make up my mind between being an academic researcher or doing R&D in industry. So I had a joint appointment with Magdalen College, where I was college lecturer in the mid-80s, and I worked for University Spinner. In fact, a Spinner called Bell House Medical Products. And most of you will know Brian Bell House. Um, so I worked for his first Spinner uh, for 60% uh, of my time and 40% as a research fellow and college lecturer at Magdalen. And eventually I decided in 1988 that I really did want to be an academic, after all. Um, and so I was uh, privileged enough to be appointed as university lecturer and tutorial fellow at St. Hugh's, picture you can recognise here. So I'm not going to ask you to ha put your hands up, because it would be embarrassing not for you, but probably for me. Uh, but a fair proportion of you, since I've been academic in the department 26 years, would have been lectured by me, probably in this lecture theatre, um, you can probably tell me over drinks from asking you to uh, put your hand up, but I would imagine that is the case given that I started in um, 1988 uh, as an academic in this department. Um, I was then elected to the Chair of Electrical Engineering, which has a professorial fellowship at St. John's in 97. Served my time as Deputy Head for a couple of years um, in 2002-2004. I actually had a, a term of being Acting Head when the Head Department was away for, for medical reasons. Um, so I knew exactly what uh, awaited me when I walked into the head of the department's office. Um, I, we, in 2001, we made a decision, and it's very clear to remember when we made the decision. We had a meeting with professor, the Regius Professor of Medicine, Professor Sir John Bell, that we were going to integrate all the engineering activities in one institute of biomedical engineering. And that meeting took place on 9-11. That's why I remember the day. And um, more than half the medics couldn't turn up, for example, the director of intensive care couldn't be there because they're all on standby in case there was a national emergency. So we had to have the meeting again three weeks later. That's when we had the idea for the Institute of Biomedical Engineering on the medical campus. We did the fundraising and I was very proud to be the um, founder director and the first director when we opened the doors in April 2008. So I did that for four and a half years, a picture of me there in front of that building uh, on the medical campus in Headington. Other things I've done since, without going into too much detail, there's a national assessment every six years <coughs> of the strength of research in UK universities. It used to be called the Research Assessment Exercise, now called the Research Excellence Framework, REF. <laughs> and so we work extremely hard for a year, 18 months, submitting the evidence. So I should probably have switched off my mobile phone, shouldn't I? <laughs> yeah. I should remember, I usually tell people at the beginning of lectures, uh, to do this. If any of you have got your mobile phones on, please switch them off. 
Um, so we spend a lot of time uh, getting our submissions ready. It's a huge investment of time and energy, but it determines the baseline funding for research for the department for the next six years. So it's hugely important. The only problem is once the submissions from every university and every department in the UK have been put together, somebody has to read them. So about three years ago, I got the letter that nobody wants to receive, which is, Dear Professor Tarasenko, your peers have nominated you to be a member of the REF National Panel, which meant that between um, uh, the 1st of January and the end of May, I had to read and grade 700 journal articles, uh, which is about 10,000 pages. So uh, becoming head of department is not too bad after that. I've just come back for our last meeting, because not only do you have to grade um, the hundreds of journal papers submitted by that discipline, you also have to read impact case studies. So I graded 700 papers, uh, graded 50 impact case studies, and uh, 15 environmental statements on the research environment. That finished yesterday, so I'm really happy today. I'm DMOB happy. That was our last... <laughs> Our last, um, um, our last task was yesterday in Manchester, so I wrote the first half of this whilst watching the um, first results coming in from the Scottish referendum on Thursday night, and then the second half on the train back from Manchester yesterday. Um, I've also been a member of University Council uh, for um, uh, just one year, and I became a member of the beginning of academic year last year. Uh, and I have been head of department for almost three weeks. <laughs> and during that time, as one or two, there's a couple of associate heads there, Dominic O'Brien, Steve Sheard over there, they will know we've had one or two tricky issues already, one of which came out completely out of left field, but I'm glad to say it was resolved uh, Thursday morning uh, with a final email being sent from, from Manchester. So, um, I, I, I'm a complete expert on how to run the department. I've been now doing it for 20 days. I do say that, um, it is an important caveat, uh, when I present the, the vision strategy, of course I've discussed it with colleagues and so on, I'm due to have the equivalent meeting with colleagues on the 7th of October. So in fact, you are being told the vision and strategy before even my academic colleagues. So all of this has got a huge caveat that um, although I know I have support, the exact details have to be worked out with colleagues. Uh, and, and please bear that in mind. I'm willing to come back next year if people are interested and tell them how much progress we have made or how many of my um, uh, ideas have been uh, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, rejected by, by my colleagues. I'm very happy to do that. <laughs> so, what uh, the department at a glance. We have few undergraduates that we used to have when I started in 1988. We used to take 180 a year. We take fewer than that. Now it's 160 to 170 numbers very slightly. Uh, so that means about 600 over the four years. We have 300 research students, 110 research staff, those are the postdoc research assistants, about 100 support staff, and 90 academics now. 90 academics, uh, including 13 statutory professors, and um, spread over the seven research clusters. These are the seven research clusters that we returned in our research excellence framework, going from um, chemical and process, civil and offshore, biomedical, etc. You can see that there's a wide range of activities, but we are a unified engineering science department, and we're unique in that. Cambridge has divisions. Um, Imperial has a faculty of engineering with 10 engineering departments within that faculty. So it is both our strength and our weakness. Because one of the weaknesses is you have a single head, namely yours truly, um, uh, and no sub-departments as they have in, in um, Imperial and, and Cambridge, and indeed as physics does, and as chemistry has in organic, organic and physical chemistry divided in three. Engineering is still a unified department, which presents tremendous challenges. And one of the things that I have done, and that I can tell you, is it's gone through, instead of having one deputy head, and I have three associate heads, Dominic O'Brien for research, Steve Sheard for teaching, showing equality between the two activity department, and the third one, Harvey Bird, for infrastructure. Harvey's on sabbatical, so as far as I know, he's not here today. Uh, we have an overall income of 31 million per year. Most of that is research income, two-thirds research income. And also, because we are very practical people as engineers, we've spun out um, more than um, 25 spin-out companies, that actually 26 or 27, um, 
uh, because one going through the process of being spun out now, since 2001, uh, more than half of these have been in biomedical engineering. So this is the department bird's eye view from above that you probably would recognise, sometimes known as the Keeble Road Triangle. Uh, and that's where, when you were here, most of you probably spent, in terms of departmental activities, most of your time. However, we are now spread over four sites with 23,000 square metres of laboratories. So we have uh, the Keeble Road Triangle here with the Tom Building, which you know well. Um, the Southwell Building at Osney, we've moved away from the old power station to a brand new building that was opened under the, uh, Professor Guy Holsby, my predecessor. Uh, the Institute of Biomedical Engineering I've already told you about, that's on the medical campus in Headington. And this is Begbrook, about five kilometres away uh, near Kidlington, uh, where we have some of the Rolls-Royce activity um, that is not in Osney. Uh, so some materials engineering um, and some environmental um, and energy work as well there. Um, probably a growing activity given the fact that there's far more space there than there is in the centre of town. We have to, not only on the research front, but also on the teaching front in terms of uh, attracting undergraduates, think about the competition. So um, this is Cambridge Department of Engineering, 300 undergraduates, twice the size that we are. Uh, very interesting that they're moving gradually away from Trumpington Street more and more to their West Cambridge site. Um, Imperial, interestingly enough, is also undergoing the same transformation, moving from their South Kensington site gradually to West Imperial, uh, near the White City. You probably uh, see it as you drive out of London on the A40 towards Oxford. So growing very fast as well, uh, a two-site strategy and a huge amount of space at Imperial West. But it's not just UK competition, it's also global nowadays. So, for example, um, we have twinned, during my time as Director of the Institute of Biomedical Engineering, we've twinned the Institute with MIT and with UCSD in San Diego. And it's very interesting to spend time there and see how they do both undergraduate education and research activity. So, some of my best friends, MIT engineers, I've spent a fair amount of time in that building um, on campus. Um, of course, they had a twinning arrangement uh, with Cambridge, which is more or less sort of fallen away. We actually do a lot with them in biomedical engineering. And probably the other main competitor is Stanford. And in some ways, it's a bit depressing when you go to Stanford. I was there about three months ago in late May, June, for about 10 days. And um, I got to meet the, the chair of electrical engineering. Chair in the US means you run that department. And he told me about their latest um, uh, fundraising exercise. They were aiming to raise $4 billion in three years. Um, they stopped after 18 months having raised $5 billion. <laughs> so so that, that, that's the competition um, that we have to face internationally. I still think it's better to come if you're a, uh, a British, not just English. We, we like Scottish undergraduates as well. Um, <laughs> if you're a British... Um, uh, 17 or 18 year old, I would thoroughly recommend you came to Oxford Ron Stanford for reasons I'm happy to explain later. But this is the challenge. We are still a minnow in many ways compared to those international co competitors and even compared to our national competitors. We're half the size of the Cambridge Department and a third of the size of the Imperial College Faculty of Engineering which has uh, 10 engineering departments within it. So, there has been growth. Um, when my predecessor Guy Holsby took over, there were about 75 academics. Uh, as he demits office, about 90, plus or minus one or two, but these are sort of rounded up figures. So, so some growth over the last five years. For various reasons, we think that 150 is probably the optimal number. Now, growing to 150 in 2020 is probably not possible, but it's a target to have anyway. That would allow us to compete on more equal terms, certainly with Cambridge. Uh, probably not with Imperial, but we probably don't want to grow as big as Imperial. But this would make us roughly equal as Cambridge. Cambridge today, and of course, they're going to grow um, during the next five or six years, but nevertheless, we would become becoming close to them. So how can we grow? Well, one of the ways to do it is to do the kind of thing that we've done in the Institute of Biomedical Engineering that we've done at Osney, we've done in other places, including robotics. Uh, you'll hear more about that later on today. And is to grow some major research institutes based on existing research groups. 
So the first three are really sort of new nanotechnology around the activities of Professor Jong Ming Kim, who's sitting at the top over there, who has got very ambitious and very exciting plans to grow that area in the department with very strong links with Korea. Um, the Oxford Center uh, for Information, which includes big data, 5G and so on. We already have some impressive activities. We have a proposal out to a, um, a foundation uh, which is willing to give us possibly large sums of money to do this. We have lots of interest in 5G from the likes of Qualcomm, the likes of Hutchison, etc. And we have a very um, good activity in the area of energy and energy systems, which we could bring together. At the moment, it's sort of different bits of activity that we could bring together to build an energy systems institute. Um, there is advanced propulsion, some of which may be at Beckbrook, some of which could be built around an expanded activity at Osney, where the Rolls-Royce University Technology Centre is. Um, Centre for Autonomous Systems, uh, which is building around the mobile robotics activity. And we can grow the Institute of Biomedical Engineering in an area which at the moment we haven't done very much in, which is biomaterials. Of course, there will always be new areas as well. Uh, I'm delighted to say that in the last 12 months, we've begun to grow, and it is exactly the right term for this activity, we've begun to grow an activity in synthetic biology. We now have, we had uh, sort of one part-time person in synthetic biology a year ago, we now have four, well, by the time the academic term has be, um, uh, will have begun, we'll have four people working in that particular area. That wasn't even on the horizon two years ago. Um, I can't say too much about the next one because it's still partly um, uh, confidential, uh, but we have some involvement. There's a lot of work in quantum um, computing in physics and materials, and engineering is now part of that activity. And, and over drinks, Dominic might be able to leak one or two bits of information that, um, uh, about what we're doing in that area. So those things happen. A year ago, we weren't really involved in quantum technologies. Uh, in two years' time, it may be a very fast-growing activity for the department. So we have to be agile and nimble and, re and, nimble and respond to new um, uh, forms of research that uh, spring forth without us being aware of them until they're with us, as it were. I just want to say very quickly to illustrate how we can do this, not that it's just pie in the sky, uh, illustrate how we would do with these three particular areas. Uh, so, for example, the, um, around what Osney is doing, as I'm sure most of you know, we've had an activity, Rolls-Royce, restart with Don Schultz well, 30, 40 years ago now. Um, we are lead university technology centre for Rolls-Royce in heat transfer aerodynamics. It's core technology of Rolls-Royce. We're excellent in a number of areas you can see there and diversifying, for example, into hypersonics, Formula One, that's all happening at Osney. And it's already been an investment in the last five years in the putting up of this new Southwell building, uh, 10 million pounds or so at Osney when they moved out to the old power station. So we can build on that and double or treble that activity maybe in the next five to 10 years, building on excellence. Um, this is really my one slide trailing Paul Newman's lecture. I hope all of you will come back and hear about the fantastic things. From a standing start, just over a decade ago, Paul is the one serious competitor to Google. And we know that because every week they try and poach his research staff. And one of the hardest things we have to do is to make sure that they stay with us rather than go off to sunny California to work for ridiculous sums of money for Google. <laughs> um, and most of them do stay. And um, that's because of the exciting work that's being done, which is leading. Paul has taken a, a, a different approach to Google on how to build these driverless vehicles and so on. And please, please, if at all possible, come back. This is going to be a really exciting Jenkins lecture um, in about a couple of hours' time. Of course, the IBME, where we would put the new biomaterials activity as well, only opened April 2008. Eight of us moved up there. Uh, we had 110 research students and postdocs and a number of support staff. If we take the State of the Union and the State of uh, the IBME um, in 2014, it is more than twice the size it was in 2008. We have 17 academics, 220 researchers and support staff. We've had 40 million pounds of grant funding from the research councils, Department of Business Innovation Skills, Department of Health, Wellcome Trust and Industry. Shows what can be done. Now, of course, this is a, a growth area. Uh, not all areas go at that pace, but it shows what can be done with the excellence of the people that we have here in Oxford. 
And now we have four clusters, I won't go through in detail, we've organised ourselves, these 17 academics, uh, with activities in biomedical single processing, biomedical image analysis, uh, ran Professor Alison Noble, he used to be a ran Mike Brady until he retired uh, three or four years ago, uh, therapeutic ultrasound and drug delivery, and regenerative medicine. And I know some of you from SOUE came round for a visit uh, two or three years ago on a Saturday morning uh, alumni weekend, um, as I say, two or three years ago. Um, and the interesting thing, and I won't have time to describe it in detail because I'm going to try and do this in 30 minutes to allow you to uh, ask me questions, is it's, uh, these are the spinouts in biomedical engineering. Now, if you ignore Paderject, which was founded in 1994, and Mirada, um, that was founded in um, uh, 1999, Biosensors and Oxonica, also from that era, all the others are uh, the last seven or eight years. So a huge spin activity. So fast, occasionally, we don't even have a logo quite yet um, for, the, for this one that was spun out last month, and there's a couple more in, in the pipeline. So we have a huge amount of spin act activity. Um, my latest spin out is Oxy Health, and this is Constant Kusios's latest spin out, Oxonics. And they've come out of a centre of excellence funded by the Wellcome Trust to the tune of 8 million. So that's uh, it's jointly Wellcome Trust and EPSRC. So the money they put in is already less than the money that we've got in investment in those two spin outs from private VC funding. So we, between Oxonics and uh, uh, Oxy Health, which have had two rounds of investment, we've attracted nearly 10 million pounds of funding. So money is flowing back but from different sources to take what was developed in the lab into products um, and, and continue the development of the technology. So um, that would be the strategy for growth. Build some major research institutes around existing and new activities with a target of 150, maybe by 2020. Um, it may, as I say, it may not be possible to grow quite as fast as that, but it's good to, to set targets. So there is one constraint, however, which is unique to, to Oxford and Cambridge, but been solved differently, existence proof in Cambridge. Um, five years ago, roughly, when the previous head of department stepped down, and this is roughly true, there were two categories of people in the department, university lecturers, tutorial fellows, and statutory professors. So 90% of the academics were university lecturers, tutorials, fellows, 85% maybe, 10-15% were statutory professors. Now we're getting a, a changing scene. We cannot grow university lecturer, tutorial, fellows because there's a finite number of colleges and colleges are not going to take more engineers. There's a cap in the city on the number of undergraduates that could be within the city boundaries, within the ring road effectively, so we cannot grow the number of <coughs> undergraduates and therefore we cannot grow the number of tutorial fellows. I mean, my hope, my dream, this is completely left field, is to have a Churchill College, uh, like Cambridge did somewhere, maybe just outside the ring road, uh, and that would be a way of all of a sudden increasing the number of engineers by 50 or 60%. But that's, that's a dream more than anything else. Anybody uh, willing to help me do that, I'd be very happy to talk to you. Um, <laughs> but for the moment, we have to assume that we're not going to be able to grow the number of tutorial fellows to more than about 70. So the other half are going to be others. So the statutory professors, we're now appointing senior research fellows, RS4s in, in university um, parlance, and we're also appointing university lecturers, non-tutorial fellows. And this is growing. The division in which physics, chemistry, engineering, we're all part of math and physical life sciences um, <coughs> division. Five years ago, there were only 18 university lecturers, non-tutorial fellows. There are now 76 university <coughs> lecturers, non-tutorial fellows. Uh, everybody's called an associate professor now, so the initials are APNTF or on ULNTF. Um, and will this work? Well, I believe so, because that's the way Cambridge does it. Only about half of the university lecturers in Cambridge have uh, college teaching in the form of, of uh, tutorial responsibilities, director of studies, etc. So if Cambridge can do it, why not take best practice from elsewhere? Um, if, if we need to, to grow the department, this is what the way we, we could do it. And it does fit in well, and there's a caveat here, I haven't had time to discuss this in detail with my colleagues, this particular bit. Uh, <laughs> I see them smiling. Um, but I do believe it fits in really well, this is serendipity with the way we run our new undergraduate course. Uh, we have a four-year MEng uh, degree, as, as I'm sure you know, uh, based on lectures, tutorials, labs and project work. 
but I'm sure this will be a disappointment to a lot of you, it is a disappointment to us, EEM is no longer available. First of all, the economists walked out, too busy teaching their economic students, and even with management, quite difficult to keep it going. Um, so now that they're fully-fledged subjects, taking lots of people, you know, it used to be just PPE, so you could do EEM. Um, now there's economics and management as a course. They have enough people to look after, not really willing to help engineers, if truth be told, put on uh, this particular course. So EEM is no longer available, which is a regrettable development, but a fact of life. So this is our course now. We now have, and most of you obviously um, uh, will, not, will not necessarily be aware of this, you actually have exams every year now. So if you remember those of you on the three-year course, you took mods at the end of first year and then finals at the end of third year. Second year was, um, well, it, it was a nice year, shall I say. <laughs> um, and now the poor kids have exams at the end of every year with part A at the end of the second year, um, part B at the end of the third year, part C in the fourth year. So there's been a redesign of the course, as you can see, this way. And it occurred to me, um, and I've started discussing with one or two people, that this course really fits in the expansion with the two types of lecturers that um, we are starting to see more and more in the department. In that, the first two years would be predominantly, of course, these, this is not hard and fast rule, but we predominantly taught by university lecturer tutor fellows because they see the undergraduates in tutorials week in, week out in the college. They teach them good habits. They teach them how to learn, how to study engineering. Um, that's coupling the lectures together with the tutorials. And you want tutorial fellows to be involved in that. I say not uniquely, but predominantly. And then we could have the third and fourth year, which becomes more specialised, got project work linked, some of it to the research institutes in the final year, for example, could be predominantly taught by the university lecturers, non-tutorial fellows and the full research professors, making it quite clear really how we do this. Now, of course, there would always be an overlap, but when we plan the course, when we plan the appointments, this allows us perhaps to see a way that we can mirror the type of people we're appointing on the research side with the type of people that we want to use to deliver the teaching, because teaching is as important as research. These are early thoughts. I may come back next year and tell you something completely different. So, we're not having a working party to review the course because it was reviewed four or five years ago, the course I showed you on the previous slide. But we've begun to discuss, and I'm very keen to do this, how we actually teach the subject in 2014. Should we be teaching it as we taught it in 1908? Well, most of you probably say no. Um, and therefore, there are modern developments that we could incorporate. Th this is part of a 10 bullet point list that I'll be showing to my colleagues on the 7th of October. Um, I've taken four because they're relevant to you as alumni in ways which I hope you'll be able to see gradually. So you've all heard of these massive online open course courses, MOOCs. Um, there's a team in Cambridge looking how to um, bring that together with small group teaching. Basically it's interactive teaching and learning and those are the principles, and it can actually be integrated with a tutorial uh, system. So we should look at that. I'm not saying we should do it, but we should look at it. We should think about the labs. How many of you remember any of the labs that you did? Is lab just turning the handle, doing another set of experiments, switching on the oscilloscope, writing down the reads? There should be something that you remember once you've graduated, even if you don't stay as an engineer. Um, the Blavatnik School um, of Government, which is a new venture in the university, is offering Everybody who turns up for a course, these are all graduate students, um, a, um, an iPad as they walk in, which is effectively the course handbook. All of our course now is on WebLearn, which is an intranet for members of the department. So you have the lecture notes, you have the slides that the lecturers use, uh, we're going to have videos of the lecturers and so on. So it's all there available electronically, which means two things. One, shouldn't we be thinking about how we use the lecture hours? There's no point just standing there and going through your slides if the undergrads would have looked at them the night before. Maybe we can use them slightly differently. Maybe we can concentrate on worked examples, um, illustrations, whatever it is. This is all to be debated within faculty, uh, but it's not the chalk and talk that there was in 1908. And as part of that, we could have iPads for every undergraduate 
when they come in because that would be their course handbook. Of course, they could bring their own devices. If they're Android people, they can use a Samsung Galaxy Tab if they prefer um, and don't want to sign up to, to Apple and, and what they do with your data in the cloud. Um, <laughs> different discussion. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that one thing I really want to do in the next five years is to reintroduce management um, as a C paper option. So run by engineers. Now, most of us don't have management expertise, even though some of us have been involved with spin outs and so on. You guys, most of you do. And I, as you know, I've either emailed or written to you. A lot of people have not been able to come this weekend. I've got literally hundreds of emails with tens of offers of coming back to help and give invited lectures in various forms of management for engineering companies. I think we could really do this and make it really exciting and relevant to undergraduates if we set up management courses and brought back alumni to give visiting lectures as part of this. Now, of course, the examinations might be slightly different, but you know, we, we're good at lateral thinking as engineers. We can solve these problems. So how do we engage you to help us with this? That, that last bullet point is already a hint of where I'm going because one of my missions as head department is to engage um, with you as alumni on department teaching and research. This is what you see when you go for 10 days in Stanford. The alumni are all over the campus. You meet them uh, over a coffee machine, you meet them in labs, you meet them talking to the undergrads, you meet them recruiting, absolutely, and that's entirely fair enough, um, and it, but that's what they're doing. Um, we haven't had that kind of connection. Why not? We can do this. So we really want to engage with alumni on department teaching and research. So. At the moment, there's nothing on our web page. This is going to change. So you might have seen that I've used Cambridge as best practice uh, from time to time. And I make no apology for this. You know, if there's another similar university that's getting some things right, why not copy and take some of their best practice? So this is what they have on their website um, in terms of alumni. Um, they mention work experience, student placements. They mention uh, being involved in uh, research collaborations. And of course, they also mention uh, philanthropy, we cannot produce a page about alumni without mentioning philanthropy. And that's a very English or British way of doing it. If you go to an American page, it's, this is how you donate. You know, <laughs> click here. Um, <laughs> we, we have a slightly different culture. Um, this is more the like Cambridge way of doing it, and you know, it's probably more the way that Oxford will do it. Um, and that's the type of thing they show you. Um, uh, philanthropy, the Alan Rees building in this particular case, uh, which was funded. And the interesting thing is, of course, philanthropy, it can be a philanthropic foundation, it can be the Qualcomm Foundation, it doesn't have to be an individual, it can be an individual, allows you to do things slightly differently to the way that um, government agencies, government research councils, or industry allow you to do. And it can be a much closer link. You know, you walk around the UCSD campus in San Diego, it didn't exist as a university 50 years ago, it's now in the top 10 and there's Erwin and I Ada Jacobs building in engineering. You know, Erwin Jacobs, who, whom I've met, the founder of Qualcomm, an electrical engineer at MIT originally, has endowed many different buildings in UCSD. Um, so um, that's allowed them to grow at a rate that would not have been possible otherwise. So in the, my last two or three slides, I want to explore this before taking questions. The message is in green, we want to build closer links with you. Um, now, those links already exist in some ways. As engineers, we're usually first in any trend. Um, we know, we're using the internet and the web before anybody else does it. Why do we have eng.ox.ac.uk as our address on the English department? It's because the engineers were doing it a long time before the English department caught up with us. So we're usually trendsetters, but we're pretty bad at telling the world that we're trendsetters. And we've done the same thing with alumni. Alumni Weekend, as I'm sure you know, is a relatively recent innovation. About 10 years ago or so they started. We've had an alumni society since 1988. Not all of you will know about it. It's the so Society of Oxford University Engineers, SOUE. It's actually been around as long as I've been a member of the department, 1988. So more than a quarter century. And all of you, I believe, just about are members because you're all uh, graduates of the department, that makes you automatically a member and we also allow uh, research staff or um, teaching staff in the department who are not Oxford alumni to join. And there's a very, very fast growing LinkedIn group, we're hearing at lunchtime, um, that has grown well beyond uh, 500 and growing fast, where you can 
uh, meet other uh, members of the Alumni Society and, and uh, liaise with them electronically through LinkedIn. Um, and so what I would like, this is not the final slide, but I'm putting it up there, is if anything of what I've told you resonates with you, please let us have your ideas either via alumniattenge.ox.ac.uk or directly to me. Now I should say at this point, and some of you may be amongst them, <coughs> I, I've had literally hundreds of emails about this. Um, because of various responsibilities, I've only answered about two or three. I'm going to do about 50. Eva has replied to everybody. There's some very, very interesting ones already, and I undertake in the next two weeks to go through those and give you individual replies because this is this has actually resonated with you and people are coming back already with amazing offers of, of, of help in, in a number of uh, uh, ways. For example, career mentoring and advice for students. So if we go for the iPad, how about a, uh, endowing an iPad for a new undergrad? Some of them will already have their own device, so bring your own device, but not all of them are um, able to afford a new iPad when they arrive in Oxford. Why not I, as Lionel Tarasenko, 1975, and Diana an iPad for a new undergraduate. First email he has when he opens is from me, and we can stay in touch via this um, because that forms a natural link. So one of the things I'd love to do is to make sure all our undergraduates had an iPad or an Android device, and as part of that, we set up links with previous generations of Oxford engineers. Placement, which has already been offered by a number of people for their companies. If we resurrect management, the six-month plan very important as part of the final year for that course. Um, internship in long vacation. To mutual advantage, you're looking for good people to recruit for your companies. Some of our brightest uh, men and women are looking to do some interesting work for eight or ten weeks in the vacations. Um, f uh, facilitating research collaborations. This is a list of the companies I am seeing in the first month as head of department. And at all meetings, there will be alumni of the, of the department. Now, it's not about signing the research contract. It was saying, but if you want to do combustion work with JLR, this is who you can talk to. If you want to do downstream or upstream with, with Shell or BP, this is who you can talk to. This is very important both ways. So facilitating research collaboration. And, of course, philanthropy, all the way from uh, funding graduate scholarships, endowing a research fellowship or a chair, funding a lecture theatre, a new lab or a new building, etc., that's conventional philanthropy, and we can do some of that in engineering. We haven't done any of it, so actually, going beyond the iPad, um, we can start thinking about doing that. Uh, we had one or two alumni in there, some uh, research fellowships in colleges, but it's been a pretty low-key activity so far. So, this is my final slide, uh, summarising the vision. So, wh what would, where would we like to be in 2020? Where we'd like to be a world-leading department competing on equal footing with Cambridge and Imperial for both teaching and research, which will require of the order of 150 academics, 50% of all fellows and 50% others. An undergraduate course with modern teaching methods. I think we need to bring the way we teach, not necessarily just what we teach, but how we teach it into the 21st century in parts of our course, if I'm totally honest with you. Um, six major research institutes duplicating the success of the IBME and OSNI in other places. Uh, could be the Oxford Centre for Information, Energy Systems, I've listed four there, I think we need about six. And the interface with undergraduates is we'd have some really exciting final year projects that would take place in those institutes. And finally, but very important to me, close interaction with alumni through internships, career mentoring, scholarships and co-ownership of department priorities, being involved in the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention.